Welcome back to the Frontier of Finance. I'm your host, James Rockwood. Rob Strinkovic's out of town today. Super excited to be joined by BMO Global Asset Management. We've got Jeff, the head of alternatives, and Lillian, the head of alternative distribution um, at BMO Gam. Welcome to the Frontier. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thanks for having us. So we're here today to talk about private markets and alternatives. I'd love to just get a quick summary of, you know, for listeners, what are alternatives? Alternatives are a lot of things. And I think that's part of the reason why people are confused or daunted by potentially investing in them. Like, depending on who you're talking to, alternatives could be liquid vehicles, it could be collectibles, could be including things like wine, sports cards. Uh, some people consider alternatives to be private holdings of real estate. So in, in, in uh, maybe a, most consequence uh, in there, you also see things like digital assets and currencies, um, some of the more speculative parts of the investment spectrum. So when we're facing the, the space, we prefer to narrow alternatives to private markets. And private markets to us, well, there's basically four food groups the way that we think about it. When we look at the four food groups, we think of private equity, which are private companies, uh, private credit, which is debt financing for those private companies. And we have real estate, which in the private market context, we're looking at buy, fix, sell. And then we look at infrastructure. And to put those four together, those are our fa- four basic food groups for private markets. How, how big would you say private markets are compared to public markets, which we all know about? So public markets meaning you know, large businesses listed on public exchange that you can buy shares of. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. And it's another reason why we bristle a little bit with the term alternatives. Alternatives implies that it's some fringy part of the market when the reality is it is the majority of the market. Like just taking the first food group that Lillian talked about, private equity. In the U.S., if you take the companies that have over $100 million of revenue, so companies of size, 85% of them are actually privately held. And so when you're thinking about getting access, diversified access to the full economy, if you exclude private markets, at least on the equity side, you're really investing in a really concentrated portion of it. Uh, when you think about private credit, private credit and private equity, like Lillian said, they're so complementary because private credit often finances private equity transactions. Now, it does a whole lot more than that, but the majority of what private credit is is the financing source for um, sponsors, so private equity firms who are buying assets, buying companies and taking them private. Um, when you think about infrastructure and the, the goal really of the next few years is to build more infrastructure than we have ever built. Some people say that we need to build two times as much infrastructure that has been built in the history of the world as we know it in the next 30 years in order to be able to get to where we need to get to uh, for, for net zero to be, to be seriously uh, attainable. So, so much infrastructure needs to get built. When you buy it in private form, you're not just buying the contracted cash flows, which public markets really value. You're also buying platforms that you can build upon. So that's one of the things we really like about the private portion of infrastructure. You could think of it as buying, you know, not just an asset, but an asset that you could then grow. You can add solar panels. You can add additional infrastructure. You can add additional ways to connect that infrastructure to the real economy. That's part of the magic of, of owning the private side of infrastructure. And when it comes to real estate, as you know, those of us who have the skill set, when I say us, I should exclude me. Yeah. Those of us who have the skill set to buy a property, to apply, uh, apply that skill set, make it better and sell it, um, privately do a lot of what real estate private markets does at scale. Buying properties, buying land, developing that land, adding value, and then selling it at the higher rate. Really works well with private ownership. When you think about the public equivalents like REITs, REITs is a perfect place to put stabilized assets that are generating cash flows. That's what investors are looking for. So not only is private markets a huge, huge, huge part of the accessible um, real economy, it also lends itself to business models that really have special outcomes uh, for an investor and within a portfolio. You covered four food groups. Can you tell me how those fit together? 
So when we look at the four food groups, you can then bring that down into outcomes. So how do we use these four food groups to get certain types of returns? So when we're looking at building a portfolio and how to use private markets in one, we look at three different ways, either as a return enhancer, or second, as an income-oriented solution, or third, as a diversifier. And at BMO, we put together a product suite that actually uh, fits into each of those three categories. So when we look, for example, to return enhancers, one of the things that, um, for outsized returns, we look to private equity. And so when we look at the four food groups, that one fits in quite nicely. So in that aspect there, what you're trying to do is invest in companies that we expect um, have that, that will grow and grow in an exponential amount. Um, so that would be a return enhancer. That would be part of our satellite approach if we're looking at a core satellite. Then if we look at what the core could be, that would be a diversifier. We're having an opportunity to take the four food groups and put it into one bundled solution. If we need more income, at that point, we would look more to like the private credit side or into real estate or infrastructure with the contracted and inflation-adjusted um, uh, income. As Lillian said, the, the three outcomes are um, really important for an advisor to discuss with their investor clients and to also think about what it is you want to do with the portfolio. What is the gap that you're missing that private markets can help address? So if you're trying to improve the returns and add a little bit more resilience, we would want to see more of the return enhancers or private equity. There's also distressed credit in that bucket, but our focus right now is more on the, on the private equity side. If you're at a certain age or it's a certain, you have a certain um, ambition to have greater income, um, credit-related strategies are, are a great place to go. And if you're simply looking to diversify against um, significant uh, public markets holdings, as Lillian said, there's, there's, there are solutions for that too. And so our, our belief is that private markets need to be really tailored uh, to what the advisor and what the investor are trying to accomplish uh, together. And what, one of the real insights that we've had in the last little while is we've been spending more time with advisors and getting to know investors better is that private markets are a little bit more familiar than people might initially think. Advisors, I know, are a little bit tentative to sometimes raise this different type of investing um, to their clients. But when they start to poke away at how is it that their clients became high net worth or ultra high net worth, at the core of that is often an entrepreneurial story. So either they're part of a family run business, maybe they are the uh, they've developed their own business, they've had some success, they've sold that business, um, or they're continuing to operate that business. But the way that they make their money, the way that they've created their family's wealth, isn't typically in public markets, it's typically in private markets. What you find with many of those investors, especially in an environment like today, where it's hard to know, like, what are equities going to be doing mm -hmm. for the next so-and-so period of time? Um, What's the credit market going to be doing? What is inflation going to look like? There are so many big questions that the answers to which have pretty significant impacts on what that portfolio looks like in terms of wealth and in terms of income, where a lot of these investors are now thinking, I'm not super comfortable with my public markets investments. I don't know what they're going to do. The next best dollar is not reinvesting in my company because I know the industry. Mm -hmm. I know the space. I know what it takes to succeed. So what we find is that using that as the starting point, you can often find great solutions that investors are really excited about, giving them the opportunity to invest in other companies that are privately held, that have professional management delivered via a private equity firm, um, that have tried and tested value creation programs. So not their, their option doesn't need to be public markets, which have a whole bunch of complexities associated with them, um, they could also be investing in another privately held company that uh, comes with all sorts of, of uh, things that give you confidence that over time it's going to generate some good, good outcome. So it's much more than just thinking, I don't want to be in, in um, public markets. I want to have some sort of non-correlated 
um, asset class that I can add to it. Like I think that's when the traditional way people think about it at a broad base to say, well, it's not public, therefore it can't be correlated. What you're saying is there's there's sort of three elements. Part of that, that's one element. That's one possibility and one one outcome that you can drive with the four food groups. But that there are, are another two options around either you know enhancing returns and and that the the role of of private markets, the role of alts in a portfolio is about um, enhancing specific pieces or doubling down on specific attributes you're looking for, just looking for a different source of that same attribute. So income, you can go fixed income or you can go private credit. Um, one question I'd have is given the, the, the big disparity, if you think about investing in both types of, of product and both asset classes, private versus public, tends to be the amount of information available. So arguably there's too much information available on public companies. Go through minutes, you can go through absolutely everything um, about that, that, that business and really kind of get into the weeds. Private doesn't seem like there's nearly as much information. So is there a challenge for um, you as an asset management firm and for advisors to explain that? Um, how do you give clients confidence around investing in private? Is there more talking about the story, what you're investing in. Like, I'd love to get a bit of a, of a sense of that. And then to that too, can you give us some examples of, of businesses that, that your funds have invested in um, to, to really help us kind of drive that home? So, so confidence and trust, we think are now more important than ever. Um, going back to the alternatives landscape, all the different things that could fit in there from speculative to imaginary in some cases if you're investing in digital art imaginary to some i suppose mm -hmm. um, to to very very real owning a piece of infrastructure that's generated like, there's there's such a wide spectrum and there's such a wide spectrum in outcomes and if we just pick one of those those three categories that lillian talked about return enhancers you'll notice that the the very top performing managers will generate fantastic outcomes, where the lower performing managers will generate really not so exciting outcomes. So the, the dispersion is so wide. So choosing the right manager and choosing the right firm is even more important in, uh, in private markets than public markets. The way that we face private markets is twofold. Um, when it comes to the income generating strategies, we rely on BMO's ability to create inventory. Um, we are a pretty well-known brand, and when people think about BMO, they think about basic banking products like you know, deposits and, and, and loans. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, that for BMO and for the other uh, big Canadian banks uh, we've proven is that over time we can be um, very successful at underwriting loans. We can be very successful at taking credit risk. And so our suite of products that are in that category, um, are direct uh, outcomes of what we do in our commercial lending business. We've designed some products that are able to extrapolate what we do as commercial lenders and then make that investable. So that's a, a really nice, we think, basis of differentiation for our firm and, and a really nice example of how um, trust can, can, uh, can really help people get comfortable where otherwise maybe they wouldn't be. When you look at private equity and growth equity and some of those other um, return enhancing strategies, we don't have the skill set in house to be able to do the type of job that some of the really great managers can do. The ones who are in that top category who are getting, you know, thirty percent, uh, you know, returns on your investment, um, we don't have that capability. And if we were to build it, we'd want to be able to show evidence of that. And to your mm -hmm. point on data, and that would take a decade to do. So what we do in spaces like return enhancers is we use our relationships, we use our expertise, and we choose among the very best providers that have strategies that are suited for the Canadian market and we'll further tailor those strategies and make it investable. So uh, those who are choosing a BMO partnership product should probably make the decision to do that on the basis of comfort in our diligence um, and we certainly uh, produce, you know, we think holistic information packets that help people understand why we chose who we chose. Um, and, 
the underlying track record of the manager. And then once you invest in the fund, you will get um, you will get information quarterly, and that information will go into things like the underlying performance of the companies that you invest in. On the diversified side, we've chosen a partner that have that has. Uh, 1,600 investment professionals all over the world. Mm -hmm. Something, we, again, we can never recreate ourselves, but we've worked with them to design a product that we think um, is a really distinctive offering in Canada, provides global exposure to all four of those food groups uh, in a way that, that truly does allow you to not only diversify your portfolio relative to public markets, but also over time you should expect double-digit yields on that investment. I think that gets into the point too that's really interesting around, th there's a general trend you see going on where asset managers want to provide the public with more access to private investments, just as a general trend. There's a ton of funds that are coming out. There's a ton of funds, that's, there's a ton of funds that are coming out. There's a, a, a ton of, of money flowing into this space. And if you consider, the fact that for such a long time, alternatives and private markets were dominated by just pure institutional investment with like no access to retail. I think it's a really great thing to start to give people more, more optionality and the ability to, to, to invest in things that aren't like purely correlated or as tightly correlated as, as public markets um, tend to be. And so thinking through that, do you think one of the advantages to of working with a, an asset manager is being able to get access to those top providers? Like you can't just give anybody money to manage, which I think is an important important part of this. Like you can't go to any private equity firm to say, "Here's here's some cash." There tends to be a bit of a process around around that. So a bit of pro, uh, access to, to products and access to to a team that can do diligence. I mean, at the top of the the, the podcast today, you basically said alt is essentially the vast majority of things you touch. You buy a sandwich, technically it's, it's from a private, private, you know, likely from a small business. A small business would be actually classified as an alt at a very high level. But as you consider that going in and start to do diligence, I mean, how do you think that, that the asset managers play, what do you think their role is specifically in trying to get people more access to, to these uh, uh, alternative and private markets? So I think that that's actually exactly what the whole mandate that we have right now is, to bring institutional quality investments to uh, accredited investors. But it's not easy. Um, and that's why investors up until now haven't really had access to it. To your earlier point, just about uh, high minimums and being able mm. to actually have those relationships with those PE firms, you and I aren't able to go down and, and no matter how much money we had, give a check and to have it invested. And so how did we come about doing this? Is we've developed a team. We have a due diligence team. Um, and, and I think how many people are on our team now? 413. Sounds like it. <laughs> we've got a monstrous team. That's it. It's huge. <laughs> it is. But everyone's really important on that monstrous team um, in order to scour the world to find those investments that are, are, are good quality. And we can do the manager selection for, for, our, for our investors and our advisors. And so I think that uh, this is a really exciting time because there is an opportunity to bring something new to the marketplace and to shift the attitude and the mindset of the advisor to start integrating these private markets. So it actually allows them to do real diversification for their clients. And you haven't been able to do that before. The large institutions have, but the accredited investors haven't. And that's why I'm really excited. So, so manager selection, absolutely important. What you buy is something that uh, we can help with. How you buy it is also something that we can really help with. Uh, minimums is, is, is one of the factors. But going back to that advisor-investor discussion, um, so should an advisor have found interest from an investor and that investor asks the question, okay, what do I buy and how do I buy it? When you start describing how you buy it in, okay, you commit some amount of money, let's say it's $10,000, but you don't actually invest it. You commit it. And then you, over the next three to five years, that $10,000 is going to get drawn from you in chunks when the manager decides to make an investment. It's really hard to explain that to people in ways that are intuitive. I want to give $10,000, but you're not willing to take it. Mm. 
okay, you're taking it, you're taking it at some point, you're going to give me a week's notice, I'm going to have to find that money and make sure that the account is funded. Once it's funded, I don't really know when I'm going to get paid back. They're going to hold it for anywhere between a couple of years, maybe 10 years on the long end. It, it's, it's, you're asking so much of the advisor, you're asking so much of the investor. And I think that's a, probably a pretty big reason why private markets has lagged, despite all of the benefits we know that uh, they can deliver to, to advisors and to investors. So part of what we do is we design the funds and we work with our partners to design the funds in a way where you can invest when you want to invest, that money gets deployed. It's deployed in a structure that's diversified enough that you can sell periodically. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for those 10 years. You can sell periodically if you need to. Now, of course, private markets, certain types of private markets, especially the return enhancers, it's appropriate to be thinking really long-term with that investment, but there are certain structures that can be designed to give you at least the flexibility if you need to enact it. So certainly the what, the diligence, the how you buy, and the support that you get along the way. And so whether we are speaking to investors directly uh, or advisors, one of the ways that we hope the market looks at us a little bit differently is that we are fully available, we're super passionate, about private markets, and we'd love to make this journey as comfortable as we can. Yeah, I think that's a definitely a, a good point because you think about the difference, you know, it's l that liquidity, right? And so if you think of like a broad-based strategy or a really traditional thought of it's not correlated to, to, to public markets, therefore, if things go really bad and I need cash, I can go to private markets, kind of breaks down because you don't have the same technical level of, of liquidity. Being able to solve that as a manufacturer and as an asset manager with the structure, with diversification, I think I think helps a lot, but then also you'd mentioned earlier and, and talked a bit about it um, before is a, a really longer term point of view. Like, can you maybe compare and contrast that the difference between how you look at a, a public um, portfolio, how you might look at a, a private portfolio or private investment, and, and talk to me a bit about um, the length of time you're going to be in. You've got that that lockup period that can exist. They're not ever quite as liquid, I believe, as as public markets, but it'd be great to kind of give our listeners a sense of when you're investing into this, what's the frame of mind you're walking in with? When we think about how to design a great private markets fund, and we break it into the categories of return enhancers, income generators, and diversifiers. Diversifiers are really well suited for liquid solutions because you can put a whole bunch of different assets in there that work well together, that generate natural liquidity. You can manage it in a way where the assets lend themselves to natural moments where investors ought to be able to get out. When you try to force liquidity, you put investors and the fund at risk. Mm -hmm. and so we're talking about return enhancers. We're comfortable with well-designed secondaries funds that are going to naturally have lots of different vintages, lots of different payoff points to design um, ways to provide investors a chance to get their money out. If you're not talking about secondaries funds, you're talking about um, you know, conventional drawdown buyout funds, we are not comfortable with liquidity in the solution because the assets don't allow for that. You would be constructing something artificial, which might feel good in the moment, but probably would disappoint investors and actually may end up causing a forced sale in a way that would be bad for all par parties involved. So you really do need to think about what is it you're trying to achieve and what features are appropriate to be putting into a fund. And that's another reason why we think trust really, really matters. Yeah, because you do need that moment, I mean, for from uh, a private equity perspective, they need to be able to deploy the cash. Like that's why you were saying earlier when they commit it and then they're going to draw down on it. Like they're they're going to need to find the opportunities to actually use the money to actually draw drive that return to maybe they're adding on something after an acquisition happens. Um, they can't just continuously deploy it in a way that that allows for it. And you, you said something interesting before around sort of secondary funds. Can you talk a little bit about that? So would that be like a fund to fund for for private equity or, or how do those things work? Yeah, the, the way, like there are, there are three primary ways to invest in, in private equity. There is um, 
making direct investments. So the manager is buying a company and then probably in a control position and operating it. There is the manager investing in another fund, um, which could provide diversification benefits um, to the uh, to the fund. And then the third way is through secondaries markets. Secondaries markets is when you've got lots of institutional money and for whatever reason, they want to rebalance their portfolio. And so they'll sell big blocks of their portfolio to seasoned um, buyers in the secondaries market who will appropriately value it and then probably put it into some other vehicle. And so you can get really nice diversification in the secondaries market. And now we're actually in an environment where there's a really big discount in the secondaries market to assessed value um, in, the, uh, in the primary market. But you can't force liquidity in a uh, private equity structure. Mm. So although, yes, you, like, they'll draw the money when there's an investment, it's not like as an investor you can say, I want my money back. Right? So when you're de- designing product, you have to make sure that the underlying matches what your liquidity structure is going to look like and what you're going to offer. So, so if we think about private equity. Yeah. The, the, what's really happening is, is a seasoned manager who's got a track record, has a, a, a market that they want to hit within, like maybe it's the mid-market, maybe it's mid-market food consumer. Like they would have a space that they would have expertise. They would have a value creation plan behind it. They would raise money from investors, committed money from investors. And then when they see targets that they really like, they would sometimes in an auction, sometimes on a bilateral basis, be able to buy companies. Usually takes, let's say, three years in their investment period to be able to deploy all of the capital that investors have made available to them. Then they're going to to apply their value creation program. And this is where public and private company management really change, it differs. Yeah. Uh, you think about public markets governance, it's largely a risk management function. You would have people who've got lots of expertise you would put on the board and they would oversee management. But really in public markets, you're investing in that management team, you're investing in that strategy. In private markets, you have a strong belief that the, that the private equity firm knows how to pick good companies, knows how to make them into great companies. And the way that they do that is by using their influence in a very active way. And so they might have full control of the board. They might have a network of advisors who have expertise that are relevant to the companies that they buy that will take an active hand in improving those companies. Now, it's not always comfortable to be a company bought by a private equity manager, yeah. but that discomfort is because they generally know how to make companies better. So very different um, decision in terms of who you are, who you believe in when you're in private markets versus public markets. It's the, the manager and their ability to apply their value creation plan um, versus public markets where you really believe in management and the existing strategy of the company. And so let, let's take that moment to compare and contrast on the timelines that you're going to be using when thinking about public versus private investments. So as a as an advisor explaining to a client and then as an investor saying kind of yes or no, how do you want to think about this when you're talking private markets and contrasting it to public? I know, I know we're spending a lot of time on private equity and, and the reason for that is it's easier to understand and it's the biggest part of the market. So maybe we'll stick on that. Going back to the advisor-investor conversation, assuming that many of these investors have either direct experience in privately owned companies or um, you know, maybe a, a previous generation in their family does. If you, in, 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 you know, maybe they they made all their they they were able to create their wealth in public companies. The same exercise I think would be quite relevant. Is if the advisor were to ask the investor to take a sheet of paper and to think about a company in particular, the one that they work with or the one that they're most affiliated with, and say, what kind of changes can you make in a quarter? What kind of changes can you make in a year? And what kind of changes can you make in five years? And I'm pretty confident that what you're going to see is very different answers. What you can do in a quarter, what you can do in a year, and what you can do in five years. And so when you have a committed manager who has the expertise, they know the space, they've got the value creation program, they have the advisors and the experts who are part of their network, 
who are invested in making this company more successful. And you go from the left side of the page, the quarterly mentality, to the how can we make this company great over five years with all the resources through private equity, finance through private credit to get there. I think you're going to find a lot of those investors are going to have a very full side of the page on the right and probably a pretty sparse part of the page on the left. And that's really the value that time gives you um, as an investor and active manager. Switching gears a little bit, I, I want to ask about the BMO Partners Private Market Fund and a bit about how it works, about your unique take on it. Um, and so, yeah, can you just talk a little bit about and explain a little bit about how, how the fund works and then anything you're really excited about in, in the fund as well? Yeah, so when we started our search to be able to find a way for investors to be able to access all the four basic food groups, it took us about a year of intense diligence with Partners Group to make sure that this was the right partner for BMO to bring. The reason why we chose them is because of their, their expertise and their long track record. And as we talked about before, manager selection really does matter. So we practice uh, what we preach. So we looked at their over 20-year track record doing a evergreen diversified portfolio and thought, this is a really great opportunity for the Canadian investors. And it's accessible. One of the main things behind it and the way that we structured it, it is something that you can buy every month. It is, it's an open-ended product. And you get access to private equity, private credit, infrastructure, and real estate in a one-stop shop. It's a one ticket solution. And the way that we see that can fit into a portfolio is that can be your diversifier. That is your core for private markets. And then you have that as your core for your private market allocation. And then you can have your satellites with some of your return enhancers. So what I'm really excited about is the fact that this is a product that's available for accredited investors and something that can suit a whole variety of portfolios. That's awesome. So having something as, as really that core finding other opportunities to add things that and satellites on top, return enhancers, um, as people are approaching and, and getting more into the, the private market space. And I think there's been a trend. I think there's a huge amount of demand that investors are waking up to the fact that most, public, most companies aren't public. Most of the public companies are investing are a very small for, portion of it. You said businesses with over 100 million in revenue were only were 85% were, were private. You know, there's a ton of money, a ton of return, and most of the things you interact with as a as a as a regular person, as a consumer, are probably going to be private um, companies, and private businesses, and so I think that's a that's a really good way to think about it, and nice kind of easy way for a client or, or an advisor to say this is where this fund fits in my mind, and this is what I'm going to use it for. As we're talking about that. Is there anything else you want to add around the product itself, um, around the approach you're taking, um, around any individual sort of businesses that are that are part of that? Like, I'd love to give you a chance just to, to chat a bit more if there's anything you want to add. Canadian investors, to the extent they do have private markets exposure, it is by and large Canadian. Mm. It's you know, it could be real estate holdings, it could be pieces of companies that they're involved with that they own. Um, when we think about diversifiers, what really has this fund stand out is almost all of the exposures are outside of Canada. And they are put together in a way that you can truly get the benefits of investing in private markets to a portfolio. And we didn't talk about this, but it's a really important point that is actually a study that JP Morgan did where they looked over time, starting off with three different constructs a portfolio that had 80% equities and 20% debt. 60% equities and like the 60-40 portfolio everybody talks about. And then one on the other side where you had majority um, credit and then minority equities. And for each one of those constructs over a long period of time, the question was what would happen if, if you added private markets to help complement that? What if you took that portfolio and adjusted it so that 20% of it was private markets? The outcomes that you get to are that your risk goes down, so risk expressed in volatility. Um, but what goes up, no matter whether you start off with 80% equities or 20% equities, is that your returns go up as well. So you're able to accomplish both the, you know, the critical things in investing. You're able to lower your risk while you're able to improve your returns. So 
when you think about the Canadian investor who's concentrated in Canada, and then you add a diversifier like Lillian has described, that is very much global, very much not Canada, you get, you truly do get those benefits uh, over time into your portfolio. Now, when we think about like, what are the things that they own? Um, this is a, a firm that has scale. They have, in addition to having many, many investment professionals, they've got over $140 billion in assets. They have scale and like a big number to describe scale is $20 billion of assets. They've got over mm -hmm. $20 billion of assets in each four of the four food groups. Um, and so they're not buying little things, they're buying big things. They're buying uh, well understood companies that have profit moats and they're helping those companies become more effective. Um, lots of examples of, of active ownership and the value they're able to create. One example that, that we really like um, addresses another topic that's very close uh, to our hearts, uh, and that's climate. Mm. Um, you often hear about how climate can be used in public markets, and that's a, a topic of intense debate, lots of opinions. Uh, you can get um, uncomfortably political very quickly. <laughs> when you think about private markets, that could be one of the levers for value creation. And so the example, we, we call this the toy story. Um, they bought a company in Europe that makes toys. They've been around for a very long period of time. And when they did their assessment, when they did their diligence, they found the purchase price that they thought they could win at to be significantly below where they thought the value was. And so during their process of trying to make sure that they hadn't missed something important, the explanation that they came to is that they were getting a discount because of their environmental record. This company makes plastic toys. Those toys weren't recyclable. They didn't use recycled inputs and they had these big um, heavy boxes in, in Europe, which might be a little bit further ahead of us on the, on the climate side. The, the size and the weight of the box is actually a driver of the taxes that you pay. And so part of their value creation program was actually re-engineering from top to bottom the product to be able to make it more environmentally friendly and thus create value. So the first thing that they did was they reformulated the packaging. They made the packaging smaller, they made the packaging lighter. Then they actually looked at the toys themselves and they reformulated the plastics. Value creation, they brought in material scientists who look at how they make the plastics and they changed it, they made some tweaks so that the plastics, once they were done their useful life, could be recyclable. And then, and so this is a couple years into the ownership uh, process, and then they went at the really big prize, the circular economy prize, where they dug into the inputs that the toys use and they were able to re-engineer, and they're still, they're the later stages of this, to re-engineer the toys so that their inputs are actually recycled materials. So they were able to make a huge impact on not only the, the, uh, the environmental footprint of this company, um, but they were able to do it in a way that directly led to value creation, led to more revenue, and led to lower costs. I think that's a perfect place to end this because it goes through that value creation, the short, the medium, the long term, um, how some of these firms can come in and, and turn things around in the private space, um, why you'd want to invest in it. So Jeff, Lillian, thank you so much for coming out onto the frontier. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This was a great conversation. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you again on the frontier. <laughs>